Welcome back everyone to the second half of the Brown Symposium, which will be held entirely virtually. Please note that this afternoon's talks, each of them has their own link that you can find on the Southwestern website at the Brown Symposium link. You can also now enter uh, questions. They can be typed into the chat. But before we start our, uh, our symposium, we wanted to take a few minutes to give you a preview of next year's Brown Symposium, which is being organized by Amy Smith in the Department of Art History and Dr. Eric Selbin in the Department of Political Science. Kim and Eric, want to tell us a little bit about it. Thank you, Faye. Thank you so much. And thank you for a great symposium so far. Um, so my name is Kimberly Smith. I'm professor of art history and holder of the Margaret Root Brown Chair in Fine Arts. And I'm Eric Selbin. I'm a professor of political science and I'm the holder of the Lucy King Brown Chair. And we're just going to give you, Eric and I are co-organizing next year's symposium, which is happening in one year instead of two because the schedule got thrown off a little bit. And we're just going to give you a very brief preview. I'll just read it right here. Um, our theme for the 2023 Brown Symposium is radical imagination, art, and social change. We are grounding this symposium in the idea that art is a potent vehicle for identifying, imagining, and articulating a more just world. Although art has and can function powerfully as protest and as critique, for this symposium, we wanted to invite our participants and our communities to think about the world building potential of art. Beyond acting as a vehicle for dissent and resistance, how can art forge room for equity, justice, and a different vision of what is possible? The symposium and its accompanying exhibition will include artwork, artists, and scholars who speak to the capacity art has had in the past and continues to have in the present to help us imagine and realize these futures. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much. It sounds very exciting. I can't wait to hopefully it'll be a normal symposium in real life, all, all of it. So our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Amy Muse, and she'll be introduced by our very own Dr. Erin Crockett, Associate Professor of Psychology at Southwestern University, and she's sitting right here next to me. Hello. I am honored to introduce to you a true star in the field of close relationships, Dr. Amy Muse. Dr. Muse is an Associate Professor at York University in Toronto, Canada, and the Director of the Sexual Health and Relationships Lab. Her research is multidimensional, investigating really important topics such as factors that help couples maintain passion over time, which I think we'll hear a little bit more about today, uh, and strategies that allow couples to successfully navigate conflict or transitional periods in their relationships. Dr. Muse is perhaps best known for her research on how couples can have more fulfilling sex lives. This research received worldwide recognition and press coverage when in 2015 she published a paper that said, suggested yes, uh, sexual frequency does predict relationship satisfaction, but once a week is frequent enough. In many ways, Dr. Muse has transformed the way our field studies sexual intimacy. Not only does she have a prolific publication record, publishing over 70 articles in the last 15 years, she is also well respected for ecologically valid methods, such as doing dyadic data collection, longitudinal work. This type of work is really time consuming and it makes her publication record even more impressive. But that type of work is also really important for moving this topic and our understanding of these things forward. It is perhaps not surprising then that she's amassed an impressive amount of grant funding over the past years and won a number of research rewards. One that's really close to my own heart, uh, in 2018, she received the Carol E. Russell Early Career Award for Relationship Research. At the start of my career as a relationship researcher, I sat at a conference where I heard Dr. Lisa Diamond, who many of you heard speak this morning, challenge our field to move beyond an understanding of sexual intimacy that really just measured sexual frequency. Instead, she challenged us to ask more sophisticated and nuanced questions around the psychological and motivational climate of sexual intimacy. And in many ways, Dr. Muse's work does just that. 
I am so excited to hear what you're going to share with us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Meese. You can just. Erin, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here. And I was at that same talk you described with Lisa Diamond, and it was hugely influential for my line of work. So I'm honored to be in this symposium with her and the others and to be able to share some of my work with you today. So hopefully everybody can see those slides. Today I'm gonna to be talking about, as Erin mentioned, keeping the spark alive in relationships. And I wish I could be giving this talk to all of you in person, but I'm very happy to be joining you at least virtually. And I want to start by acknowledging the land that I'm joining you from today and the land on which I've conducted the work that I'll share with you. So I want to acknowledge York University's presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, and it's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. So I want to honor this land and express my gratitude to live and work here. Now, one of the questions that I've been focused on in my research is how couples can keep their sexual spark or their passion alive over time. So many couples might fondly remember those early stages of their relationship. It's well established that sexual desire, attraction and passion tend to be high during this time. But then over time, as relationships become more familiar and comfortable, desire and passion tend to fade. And although couples can remain quite close and connected despite this, declines in desire are not inconsequential for relationships. People who report lower desire for their partner, they tend to feel less satisfied and they have more thoughts of leaving their relationship. And the maintenance of our, relation, our romantic relationships matter. So I'm a social psychologist and a relationship science, scientist, and I've focused my research on understanding how people can maintain happier and more fulfilling relationships. And I think this is important because one of the most robust findings in both social and health psychology is that our social relationships are a powerful predictor of our health and well-being, especially our romantic relationships. So being involved in a satisfying romantic relationship is an even stronger predictor of how long people live than other factors that we more commonly think of as being associated with mortality, things like smoking, alcohol consumption, or obesity. And much of my work has focused on the role of sexuality in relationships. So maintaining a sexual connection with a romantic partner is also important in part because it can have these broad implications for well-being. So to provide one illustrative example of this in my own work, using national representative data for more than 30,000 people in the US, I compared the effects of sexual frequency, so how often people have sex on well-being, and I compared that to the association between income and well-being. So in this graph, you can see that sexual frequency is represented by that red line, and then income is represented by the blue line. And the outcome that I'm looking at here is general well-being or like overall satisfaction with your life. So one thing that we found in this data is that the increases in well-being gained from having sex once a week compared to once a month is greater than the increase in well-being gained from making an extra $50,000 a year. Good to know. But one thing I wanna point out from this work is that couples who had sex more frequently than once a week did not report greater well-being than those who reported weekly sex. So I always think of the takeaway from this finding is that it's important to try to make that time for sexual connection with your partner, but you don't necessarily have to aim to engage in sex at very high frequencies, such as, as those that are more characteristic of those early passionate stages of a relationship. And one of my favorite sets of findings to talk about when I discuss the links between sex and well being is that even after accounting for numerous important predictors of health, married people who report ongoing satisfying sexual encounters in their 70s were less likely to die in the ensuing five years. Again, good to know. So, despite the importance of sex for relationship satisfaction and well being, a fulfilling sex life and a high quality relationship can be difficult to maintain. I like to show this cartoon as well. It depicts a couple where one partner initiates sex 
And the other asks, can we role play a couple who are too tired to have sex? And I like it because I think this illustrates this tendency for desire and sexual satisfaction to normatively decline over the course of a relationship. But more than that, disagreements about when and how frequently to engage in sex are common in long-term relationships. And in fact, in one study, disagreements about sex were one of the top three most cited arguments among couples in their first five years of marriage. And these types of conflicts of interest about sex can be among the most challenging types of conflict to successfully resolve. Now, I think that one reason why we see these normative declines in desire in relationships has to do with this challenge that many of us have with balancing the need for security and the need for novelty. So people have this fundamental need to belong and connect with others. And this is part of what propels us towards long-term relationships in the first place. But people also tend to have a need for novelty and excitement. And interestingly, it's often novelty, uncertainty, excitement that promote sexual desire, but then it's things like safety and security that promote commitment. And often in long-term relationships, we want both of these things. So what, we, what trend we typically see is that desire and passion are quite high in new relationships, but then this tends to decline as people become more secure and committed to their relationships. So one of the things I've been interested in my research is in understanding how desire can be fostered in established romantic relationships. And I think one answer to this question is considering how some novelty and uncertainty and excitement can be injected into these secure relationships. So one theory or explanation from relationship science that's uniquely positioned to inform these types of questions is self-expansion theory. So according to self-expansion theory, we're innately motivated to broaden our sense of selves by having novel experiences, learning new perspectives, and gaining new skills. So for example, a person might expand their sense of self by traveling and seeing different ways of living, by learning about a new topic in which they were previously unfamiliar, or by obtaining new skills and abilities. But one key source of self-expansion is involvement in a romantic relationship. So self-expansion in the context of a romantic relationship represents the extent to which a romantic partner can facilitate this attainment of new resources, perspectives, and characteristics, as well as the extent to which they might provide opportunities for novelty and excitement. So as you can imagine, early in relationships, opportunities for self-expansion are numerous since partners are learning a great deal of new information about each other and they're often having many novel experiences together. So a person in a new relationship might learn about their partner's music preferences and then they may start to adopt some of those preferences as their own. They're often introduced to new friends and family members. They might try new different activities together, learn new things, and also gain some insight into their own perspectives and interests. Now, although these opportunities for engaging in novel experiences with a partner do tend to normatively decline over time in a relationship, research has shown that engaging in shared novel activities with a partner can revitalize some of these feelings of self-expansion, even in the context of a long-term relationship. And then this can have implications for how satisfied we feel with that relationship. So in one study, when couples were assigned to engage in a novel activity together in a lab setting, they reported higher relationship satisfaction following the activity compared to couples who did something that was pleasant but mundane. So what I've been interested in is understanding the types of self-expansion that couples might be doing naturally in their day-to-day -day lives and over time in their relationship. And then I'm also interested in how self-expansion might have these unique effects on the maintenance of desire and passion in relationships. So today I wanna to present some of the work from my research lab at York University that I think demonstrates that engaging in these self-expanding activities is one way that long-term couples might keep their sexual spark alive. And one reason why I thought self-expansion might be uniquely positioned to inform this is because self-expansion often involves some element of novelty, and we know that novelty can promote sexual desire. 
And then since self-expanding activities have also been shown to promote closeness and relationship satisfaction, self-expansion may be one way that couples can combine novelty and security to enhance both their sexual desire and their relationship satisfaction. So in the talk today, I'm hoping to share some research with you that makes five key points. So specifically, that self-expansion does play a role in the maintenance of sexual desire in long-term relationships. That desire can be enhanced through shared self-expanding experiences with a partner. That higher self-expansion can also buffer against some of the negative consequences of coping with lower sexual desire that it's important that we balance both personal and relational self-expansion and that differences between partners in a relationship can at times create opportunities for self-expansion. So first, when I started this line of work, I looked into self-expansion in couples' daily lives and how this was associated with desire and satisfaction over time. So this particular study included 118 couples. They were about 32 years old on average, and they'd been together for an average of five years. Now this was a 21 day daily experience study with two longitudinal follow-ups. So essentially what this means is that both partners would independently complete brief surveys online about their relationship and their sex life for 21 consecutive days. So they would, it was just a daily survey and they would just sort of give us a snapshot of their relationship that day and respond to a number of different questions that we had. And then we would follow up with them right after those 21 days, as well as three months later. So we could see how the experiences that they're reporting on during that daily study are then associated with relationship maintenance over time. So in the daily surveys, we asked a number of things, but what we're interested in here is self-expansion. So we asked partners to report on how self-expanding their relationship was each day. And so these are just a couple examples of the items we would ask. How much should being with your partner result in you having new experiences? How much should being with your partner expand your sense of the kind of person that you are? And people would rate these each day on a seven point scale from one not at all to seven very much. And what we were interested in is what happens on days when people report higher self-expansion than would be typical in their relationship. And on days when a person reported some level of self-expansion in their relationship, I would ask them to write about an activity that might have led to those feelings. So I just wanted to share a few examples with you of the types of things that participants said. So they would sometimes talk about taking a trip together. We went on a road trip today and sang a lot or learning something new together. I took my partner to an oyster farm in which she'd never been to. We shucked the oysters for the very first time. We took a ballroom dance class. She taught me how to make a cherry pie. We played beer pong. And some of the experiences people mentioned had negative aspects as well. We had a super intense disagreement and then turned it around. It was a huge opportunity for growth. I would then ask people about some of the key outcomes that we're interested in, just using brief measures targeted towards that day. So I felt a great deal of sexual desire for my partner that day. We would ask it whether or not the couple had engaged in sex that day and then how satisfied they felt with their relationship. So what did we learn from this study? Well, on days when people reported higher levels of self-expansion in their relationships, so days that they felt involved more novelty and broadening of their perspective than was typical, both they and their partners did report higher sexual desire for each other. Couples were about 34% more likely to have sex on these days that involved higher self-expansion. And then in turn, both partners were more satisfied with their relationship on these days. So essentially what this suggests is that these natural heightened days of self-expansion, even in these longer term relationships, is associated with both partners feeling higher desire the desire actually translates into being more likely to engage in sex, and then ultimately both partners are happier that day. And then as I mentioned, I also followed up with couples directly after this 21 day study, as well as three months later. So I could look at how their experiences they're telling us about during those 21 days were associated with relationship satisfaction over time. So after accounting for how satisfied both partners were when they began the study, 
people who reported more self-expanding experiences over the course of that daily 21 day daily experience study felt more satisfied right after the 21 days and so did their partners. So this means that self-expansion was associated with these increases in relationship satisfaction for both partners over the course of the study. So these experiences aren't only having benefits that day, but they're extending beyond that. And then in fact, partners were able to maintain this higher relationship satisfaction three months later. So this suggests that these benefits of self-expansion self -expansion can be longer lasting. So in this type of work, I also try to consider whether the findings can be attributed to other explanations. So here, the effects that I reported on couldn't simply be attributed to spending time with the partner. This really wasn't about just spending any type of time with a partner, but the aspect of like novelty, excitement, and broadening was important. And then similarly, it wasn't attributed just to positivity. So we were also able to account for like how positive people felt on those days. And we still see those effects. So this isn't just about spending pleasant time. The self-expansion aspect seems to be important here. And people did engage in a variety of different types of activities. And one of the things that I'm often asked is like which activities are sort of the best for self-expansion. So we coded all the activities and we grouped them into different themes based on what types of things that they involved, but really our effects didn't differ based on the type of activity. It really seems like it's about the feelings of self-expansion more than what activity leads to it. So this could be pretty idiosyncratic between couples and it might be you know, what the partners would find most self-expanding. Now, we also coded these activities for how physiologically arousing they were. So something that's quite high in physiological arousal would be like going bungee jumping or going skydiving. And then there were activities that were much lower in physiological arousal, like watching an interesting documentary. But the effects didn't change based on the objective level of arousal of these activities. It seemed like self-expanding activities that are both high and low in arousal could be associated with higher desire and relationship satisfaction. Now we had a wide age range in this sample, but our findings were consistent across age. They didn't differ by gender. And if anything, they were strongest for people in longer compared to newer relationships. So higher self-expansion led to higher desire for both people who were in shorter and longer relationships but the effect is strongest for those couples who've been together longer. And maybe they just have a little bit more room to grow there because of these normative declines we see in desire over time. So study one shows that on days when people report more self-expansion in their daily lives, both partners report higher sexual desire. And in turn, couples were 34% more likely to engage in sex and they felt more satisfied. So given this, we wondered if we could enhance or boost people's sexual desire by instructing them to engage in shared self-expanding activities with their partner. So the previous study that I mentioned looked at what couples are naturally doing in their daily lives. And here we're gonna tell them about self-expansion and have them engage in an activity to test whether this would boost desire. So we wanted to know if telling people about the benefits of self-expansion for relationships and then actually encouraging them to do novel, exciting things with their partner over an upcoming weekend would be linked to sexual desire and then in turn relationship satisfaction. And then this type of design would also allow people to choose their self-expanding activity and it could be something they would actually do with their partner in daily life. Um, so to look at this, we recruited 198 people who were in relationships. We did this all online and it was a two-part study. So these participants were about 33 years old on average. They'd been together for about seven years. So let me walk you through how this study worked. So participants would join our study and they would be randomly assigned to one of three groups. The first group was our self-expansion group. And so they would read an article that was reporting on new research that was showing the benefits of engaging in novel and exciting activities. So essentially telling them self-expansion is good for your relationship. In our second group, the familiar and comfortable group, people read a very similar article, except this was touting the benefits of familiar and comfortable activities. And we wanted to have this comparison so that we could see if self-expansion 
would boost these outcomes above and beyond just doing something sort of nice and positive with a partner. And then we had a no article control group that were given nothing to read. So to make the experiment as realistic as possible, participants in our two groups, self-expansion and familiar and comfortable, were asked to try to engage in those particular types of activities over an upcoming weekend. And then participants in our control condition didn't receive any information or instructions. They were just told that we were gonna follow up with them after the weekend on a Monday. So we recruited everybody on a Friday, two of the groups read the article, they were asked to engage in those respective activities. And then we followed up with everybody on the Monday and asked them all to kind of tell us about their weekend and how they were feeling about their relationship. So first, we just wanted to see if we were able to um, increase novel activities and relationships. So were the people in our self-expansion group actually going to go out and do more novel things? So we had people in each condition just rate how much they did novel things with their partner over the course of that previous weekend. And so people in our self-expansion condition, they're represented by the red bar here, they did report engaging in more novel experiences compared to both those in the familiar and comfortable group, that's the blue bar, and those in the control group represented by the green bar. So we were able to boost self or boost self expansion, encourage people to do more novel things. But what we're really interested in is whether this would then boost desire and satisfaction. So for relationship satisfaction, people in our self expansion group did report significantly higher relationship satisfaction than our control group. But interestingly, people in the familiar and comfortable group, they also saw this boost in relationship satisfaction, not as much as the self-expansion group, but there was still a boost there. So, I mean, it was also good for relationships to engage in these familiar and comfortable activities. But importantly, it was only the self-expansion group that reported significantly higher sexual desire compared to the control group. There were no differences between the familiar and comfortable and the control group on their level of sexual desire. So what we did was we compared the self-expansion group to our control group and we saw that the self-expansion group did show these boosts in desire and in turn boosts in their overall relationship satisfaction. And we don't see this for the familiar and comfortable group. So this demonstrates that one reason why those people in our self-expansion group were the most satisfied after the weekend was because they experienced this significant boost in their sexual desire for their partner. But then what about sexual activity? Were they actually more likely to engage in sex with their partner? So in this study, what we did was look at the percentage of people in each of our groups who reported having sex with their partner over that previous weekend. And people in our self-expansion group were the most likely to engage in sex. 75% of them told us that they had engaged in sex with their partner over the weekend. But the majority of couples in all groups had engaged in sex with their partner. This might have been because we did the study over the weekend and there's some other research showing that couples are more likely to have sex on the weekend compared to weekdays. So we don't see any significant differences between this group. However, there's this trending difference where the self-expansion group is reporting somewhat higher sexual frequency than our control group. So in addition to self-expanding activities that might naturally occur in couples' daily lives, when people are encouraged to pursue these novel, exciting activities with their partner, they also experience a boost in desire. And then this in turn leads to feeling more satisfied with their relationship. And in some cases might make them more likely to engage in sex with their partner. So far, hopefully I've demonstrated the role of self-expansion in maintaining and enhancing desire. But given that having low desire is common in relationships and over time, we also wanted to know what role self-expansion might play in buffering or protecting against some of the negative consequences of low desire. So as I discussed at the outset of the talk, regular positive sexual interactions are one reason why romantic relationships have these long-term health and well-being benefits. But at the same time, a lack of interest in sex is a very common sexual concern, and it's particularly common among women. So in fact, in a nationally representative sample of women in the United States, up to 41% reported low desire that lasted several months over the past year, 
and up to 30% of women reported that the low desire they experienced was accompanied by significant associated distress. So they had low desire and they were also pretty distressed about it. And low sexual desire does have these consequences for relationship and sexual quality. So women who report low sexual desire often report poorer relationship and sexual well-being. They often have lower desire than their partner, so they might be managing these differences in their sexual interests. And then this can be a source of conflict between partners. They also tend to have a greater difficulty communicating about sex and then they report less sexual enjoyment. And the partners of people experiencing low desire can also experience some negative outcomes as well. So when we compare couples who are not coping with a sexual problem, the partners of women with low desire report lower sexual satisfaction, poorer sexual communication, and higher sexual distress. And people with low desire partners might also feel less sexually desirable and they may be rejected more frequently when they're initiating sex, both of which can be linked to lower satisfaction and desire and more negative feelings. Women coping with a sexual problem also tend to, at times, avoid touch and affection with their partner to prevent against negative sexual experiences from occurring. However, when they do report maintaining affectionate behaviors with their partner, like kissing and cuddling, they do feel more satisfied with their sex life and relationship. So more and more research is suggesting that these relationship factors can be important for understanding how couples might cope with low sexual desire, even clinically low levels of sexual desire. So in my lab, we're also interested in self-expansion, helping to buffer against some of the negative aspects or some of the challenges that occur in relationships. So things like conflict and sexual distress that couples with low desire commonly experience. And one thing that we know from previous research is that positive relationship experiences can build up and almost create this arsenal of positivity that can also help couples cope with challenges. So perhaps couples who see more opportunities or have more experiences of self-expansion in their relationship might build up this arsenal of positivity and then might exert greater effort in their relationship. And this could result in more effective problem solving or just even make their problems seem less daunting. So in this work, which is led by my graduate student, Stephanie Raposo, we conducted a study of 97 women with low desire and their partners. And the partners were mostly, but not exclusively men. So to ensure that couples were coping with distressing levels of desire, we collaborated with a team of clinical psychologists at Dalhousie University. And we recruited women who met the diagnostic criteria for female sexual interest and arousal disorder or SIAD for short. So all of the women in the study met criteria essentially for clinically low levels of desire with this accompanying distress. And then participants were on average about 32 years old. Couples have been together for an average of eight years. So just to give you a sense of how women and their partners responded to questions about sexual desire, one way we asked this was over the past four weeks, how often did you feel sexual interest or sexual desire or interest for your partner? And then they would rate this from one almost never to five almost always or always. And so you can see that the women, they're represented by that red circle. On average, they're at the pretty low end of the scale. And then this is different from partners represented by the blue circle who are you know, above the midpoint of the scale. So on average, these couples are navigating these different levels of sexual desire. And the duration of low desire was fairly long. On average, the women had been coping with this low desire for about four and a half years. We also asked both partners how self-expanding their relationship tends to be, their level of sexual satisfaction, relationship satisfaction, how often they're affectionate with each other, their level of sexual distress, so how distressed they are about aspects of their sex life, and then how often they have conflict in their relationship. So what did we learn here? Well, the women with low sexual desire who reported higher self-expansion in their relationship did report feeling more satisfied with the relationship, more satisfied with their sex lives, 
they had more desire for their partner. And remember, this is in the context of clinically low levels of sexual desire. And they also reported being more affectionate with their partners. And we know that when women or couples are coping with a sexual problem, maintaining affection is a really important way to maintain relationship and sexual satisfaction. We also had partners report on the same aspects of their relationship. And when they reported that they derived more self-expansion from their relationship, they felt more satisfied with their relationship, with their sex life, and so did their partners. They also, when they felt they were also more affectionate or they saw more affection in the relationship. And then uniquely for partners, they reported lower sexual distress and less relationship conflict. So perceiving more self-expansion, more opportunities and experiences of growth and novelty in the relationship, it not only helped both partners maintain satisfaction and affection, but it also mitigated some of these negative consequences, right? The, the sexual distress and the conflict that tends to be heightened when couples are coping with a sexual issue. So in sum, self-expansion was associated with more positive outcomes for both partners, even though they're coping with this distressing sexual issue. But more self-expansion also mitigated some of the negative consequences, especially for partners. So this sexual distress and conflict. Now the findings emphasize the role of relational factors such as self-expansion in coping with low desire. And then this could be a novel target when we're thinking about clinical interventions for couples who are coping with low desire. And more and more there's interest developed, developing and focusing on these relational factors. So hopefully at this point of the talk, I've convinced you that self-expansion or novelty, broadening, excitement with a partner can help to maintain and enhance desire and may also help couples navigate sexual challenges. So far, the work that I've discussed with you has focused solely on shared self-expansion or relational self-expansion that happens together with a partner. But of course, it's also possible to experience personal self-expansion or self-expansion that doesn't involve your partner. So next, I want to talk about the role of self-expansion that occurs outside of the relationship and if and how this might translate into feelings of desire for a partner. So as we've already discussed, passion and sexual desire appear to be one of the most fragile relationship elements. Pretty much all of the major theories about these constructs predict that sexual desire will peak early on in a relationship and then steadily decline over time. And in all of the work I've talked about so far, I've focused on relational self-expansion or these shared novel activities that partners do together. And I've shown that these are associated with higher desire. Now, you may not be able to tell, but the example of relational self-expansion here is me and my partner walking on the edge of the CN Tower a few years ago. However, these types of shared self-expanding activities with a partner does require joint coordination. Right? Couples might not always agree on or have the overlapping time and resources to engage in these types of experience together. So it's likely then that the majority of our personal growth experiences or personal self-expansion will occur outside of our romantic relationship. So for example, we might experience personal self-expansion at work, say giving a talk about your research or through our hobbies. But when we set out on this line of research, we knew far less about how these types of personal self-expanding or personal growth experience, experiences might influence the relationship. Oops. So on the one hand, we might expect that personal growth would facilitate sexual desire for a partner. It's a rewarding, positive experience, and this might transfer to the relationship Growing on a person's own might help to create space to reignite sexual desire. And in line with self-expansion theory, personal self-expansion outside of the relationship 
might provide new experiences and self aspects that people could then share with their romantic partner and that could help to reignite desire. But on the other hand, a lot of personal growth outside of the relationship could cause couples to grow apart growing and expanding outside of the relationship could just take partners in different directions. So to test these ideas, we again conducted two daily experience studies, which I've told you about at the beginning of the talk. And here couples are reporting on both their daily personal and relational self-expanding experiences. And so this personal self-expansion, self-expansion that happens outside of the relationship, was assessed with items like, how much did you feel a greater awareness of things? And then relational self-expansion, which is the shared experiences with a partner, was assessed as it was in the other studies. So how much did being with your partner result in you having new experiences? Now, one of the things that's cool about collecting daily experience data is that we can look at daily changes within a person. So we can look at on days when people are higher versus lower in personal self-expansion than their average. And what we found here is that when people experienced an increase in their daily self-expansion, so a day when they had more personal growth outside of their relationship than they usually would, they reported higher desire for their partner. And this appeared to be largely explained by participants both experiencing greater intimacy on these days and more positive emotions on these days. So when they experience this rise in personal self-expansion. So in other words, on days when people reported more personal self-expansion than usual, so these were these naturally occurring increases in personal growth, they would feel more intimacy and closeness with their partner. They would report more positive feelings. And then for both these reasons, they reported higher sexual desire for their partner. So this does mean that these daily increases in growth or novelty outside of the relationship are linking up with higher desire for a partner. But this type of data also allows us to look at average levels of personal self-expansion over the study. So what we can test here is whether chronic or consistently high levels of self-expansion outside of the relationship are also associated with desire. And here we actually see the opposite effect. So people who are higher in personal self-expansion across those 21 days, so those people who sustained those really high levels of personal growth, they actually reported lower desire for their partner. And then this was largely explained by these high personal self-expanders having lower levels of intimacy. So this suggested that these individuals might grow apart from their partners. And then because this higher, because it's higher intimacy that's linked to higher desire, the lower intimacy that these high personal self-expanders were having was actually linking to lower desire. Now, I do want to point out though that these personal self-expanding experiences were still positive people reported more positive emotions when they engaged in more personal self-expansion. And we know from other work that they also tend to experience higher well-being. So this chronically high personal growth is typically good for the self, but it seems like it might be linked to lower desire or interest in a partner. So thus, while this brief increase in personal self-expansion appeared to benefit desire in relationships, doing so more chronically may have led partners to drift apart. So in our future work, we're hoping to examine how to offset some of these negative effects of chronically high personal self-expansion. So maybe helping individuals translate their individual experiences into relational ones. So maybe things like sharing or telling a partner about your personal self-expanding experiences might help those translate into positive outcomes for the relationship as well. And we think this is especially important because we don't want to tell people not to engage in personal growth. There's lots of benefits to doing so, but it seems to be more about balancing this personal growth and also experiences of relational growth. So therefore, although relational self-expansion seems to have these consistent benefits for relationships, 
personal self-expansion can be both beneficial as well as a source of drifting apart if done chronically. So suggesting that balancing both personal and relational self-expansion might maximize the benefits. Now, finally, I wanna discuss some brand new research showing that differences between partners in a relationship can provide opportunities for self-expansion. So in a new line of research, which is led by my former graduate student, Alexandria West, we've been investigating opportunities for self-expansion in intercultural relationships. So intercultural relationships are relationships in which partners have different cultural backgrounds. And we define this fairly broadly in our work. So we would include interracial couples, so couples with different racial identities, couples with different national identities, so from different countries, or those with different religions or faiths. And intercultural relationships are increasingly common. Some studies in North America have found that many people have dated interculturally and many more are at least open to the idea of doing so. And in fact, in our research pool at York University, in any given year, we see about equal numbers of students in intercultural relationships as same cultural relationships. And in other data, about 50% of teens and young adults have or would date a person of a different culture. So both acceptance of and engagement in intercultural relationships seems to be increasing. Intercultural marriages are on the rise as well. And in fact, this is the fastest growing type of new marriage in the US currently. However, intercultural marriage is still much less common than intercultural dating. Now, all relationships face some issues, but research shows that intercultural couples face some unique issues in navigating their cultural differences. So in one example from our own work, intercultural couples at times experience less support from their social networks or families and may have more experiences of marginalization than couples of the same race or culture. So if an intercultural couple faces a lack of family support, or marginalization, so they feel that their relationship's not approved of, this tends to spill over into their relationships and then they feel less satisfied as a result. But the different cultures and perspectives that partners might bring to an intercultural relationship can also provide a huge opportunity for growth. And it's this piece that we've begun to explore in this new line of work. So in two studies that are part of this ongoing project, one in which we've recruited people who are in intercultural relationships and the other in which we've recruited both members of intercultural couples, we ask them about the degree of cultural sharing that happens in their relationship. So what we mean by this, or this is the extent of open and supportive communication that happens in the relationship about partners' cultures and their cultural differences or similarities. And we measure it with items like this. So my partner values my cultural or ethnic beliefs and customs. So what we thought was that partners who valued and engaged in cultural sharing more often might report more self-expansion in their relationship in general. And, and this is assessed the same way that we've been talking about in the other studies. But we also thought that this could result in a unique type of self-expansion or a cultural specific type of self-expansion. And we assess that with items like, how much do you feel that you have a larger perspective on things because of being exposed to your part partner's culture? So this is self-expansion that might derive from cultural differences specifically. And when people reported some degree of cultural self-expansion happening in their relationship, we asked them if they could think of examples of you know, when they felt this way. So I just wanted to share a few of those with you. I joined a black church with my mother-in-law, very different. I feel more comfortable being able to praise God so vocally instead of quiet. Knowing their parents, living with them during Christmas was a very big and exciting cultural shock. I spoke with them about the traditions that I have regarding my Mexican origins. Visiting my partner's hometown gave me perspective on who I am as a person and on my own cultural upbringing. So what we ultimately found across the two studies is that intercultural relationships 
or intercultural couples who reported more sharing and valuing of each other's cultural culture did in fact report higher self expansion. And this was both general relational self expansion, as well as this cultural specific self expansion. And then in turn, these each had unique associations. So this cultural sharing led to this broader relationship self expansion. And then in turn, that was associated with higher relationship quality and less conflict in their relationship. And then the cultural specific self expansion had these unique, more cultural related outcomes. So partners were actually better able to integrate their couple and cultural identities. So meaning they could better incorporate their partner into their culture and bring their culture into their relationship. And we know from other work that, you know, this type of integration is important for relationship maintenance of intercultural relationships. This was also associated with partners reporting more cultural self-awareness so they could better understand how their culture had influenced them. Now, one approach to cultural differences that we sometimes hear about is to pretend that they don't exist, ignore them or take this colorblind approach where we claim not to see racial or cultural differences. But this work and a lot of other research is suggesting that that's not helpful and instead valuing and sharing these cultural differences can provide unique opportunities for growth and for greater self awareness. And although intercultural couples can experience some unique barriers in their relationships, often from external sources. Intercultural relationships can also provide these unique opportunities for self expansion when couples are able to discuss and engage with their cultural differences. So I hope today that I've been able to convey the potential of romantic relationships for providing opportunities for novelty and self expansion and that if pursued self expanding experiences can help couples maintain or ignite that sexual spark that so often fades over time and that these positive experiences can also help couples manage challenges that personal growth is also important and might have benefits when it occurs alongside relationship growth and that at times our differences can create these unique opportunities for growth and ultimately that self expansion is one way that couples can keep their spark alive over time. So research is certainly a team sport and this work is a result of many collaborative relationships. So these are the key members of the research team who contributed to the work that I presented today. And I also want to thank my lab, the sexual health and relationship lab at York University for just making my job so enjoyable. And thanks to all of you for listening. I am thrilled to be a part of this and I really look forward to hearing what questions you have today, but also invite you to reach out to me after the talk if you want more information about this work. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Amy, for a very informative and useful practical talk. Um, we do have some questions and I'd like to remind everybody that they can, oh, that they can continue to ask questions. I'll try to monitor it while we're, um, while Amy is answering questions. Um, so, and it's open in the Q and A. So the first question, uh, these are, there are two related questions about the article reading study. Uh, one question was, how do you control for differences in the level of sexual desire before they engage in the study and read the articles? And was there a reason for the difference, differences in sample size, such as differential attrition that might have led to different, sample, different group sizes? Oh yeah, those are great questions. So the first question, there's sort of two things that we can do, right? So we do random assignment. So people are randomly assigned to those different groups. And the idea there is that there's gonna be no differences to start with across those groups. So what we can do is, we usually ask about desire and a number of other things before we give them the article and ask them, you know, give them their instructions. So we know that the groups all started with similar levels of sexual desire on average. So any 
boost that we're seeing, we're hoping, you know, we hope we can attribute that to our manipulation, but we also know their level of desire. So we could even control for each person's initial level of desire, and then we would still see these boosts. So, you know, that's something that we do so that we can try to be more confident that it has something to do with our manipulation and not just to like higher desire people kind of being in the self-expanding group already. Yeah, so the different numbers of participants in each group, it's partly due to attrition, but the biggest reason is that we have additional manipulation checks for people in the experimental group. So if people were in our self-expansion or familiar and comfortable group, we ask them more like attention questions to make sure that they actually read the articles and things like that. And of course, there's always a percentage of people who don't follow the instructions and we would remove them from our sample. But in the no article control, they didn't have anything to read and they didn't receive any instructions. So they didn't get those same manipulation checks about whether they were, you know, paying attention. So we had other ways of making sure that they were good, high quality participants. But that's why we have some different numbers across those groups. I think that's what the question was referring to, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question was, uh, were you able to work with any same gender couples? Yeah. So I should have mentioned that we always, very typically recruit inclusively. So we invite all couples to participate in our studies unless we have very specific requirements. Um, so within those samples, there would be anywhere from five to 10% of representation from same gender couples. Um, so I should have reported that more clearly, but we are inclusive in, in most of our samples. Okay. Um, Another question is, today you focused on romantic relationships and self-expansion. Are there any implications for other types of relationships, such as friendships? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, as relationship researchers, we've really focused on romantic relationships, like over-focused. And I'm not actually sure the extent to which there's been research on friendship self-expansion, although I suspect you would see very similar things. The even personal, you know, a lot of those personal self-expanding experiences, they weren't necessarily solo experiences. They were just outside of the relationship. So certainly a percentage of those experiences would have involved, you know, doing things with friends, engaging in hobbies with friends. And just like our romantic relationships, our friendships are also a source of self-expansion without question, right? When we, when we develop new friendships, we also learn new things, maybe get exposed to new hobbies. So there hasn't been as much empirical work done on friendships. I mean, if there's people out there that are looking to get into this field, that is potentially an untapped area. But I suspect that you would see a similar thing where higher self-expansion from friendships would also be associated with these like positive outcomes in those relationships as well. Awesome. Another question that we have is, how much of the self-expansion activities are causing just positive feelings and well-being and it's really about anything that makes you feel positive or increases well-being could act as a yeah we really wanted to look at that because when you see some of the examples i think sometimes they just seem like you know things that couples might do they're positive um so we worked pretty hard to try to rule out that alternative explanation and we've done a number of things so we just look at like how much time couples spend together we look at like their positive experiences together that aren't necessarily self-expanding. We control for just their positive affect, their positive emotions each day. And when we do all of those things, we still get those effects, like those unique effects of self-expansion, um, which convinces me at least that there's something about this novelty and excitement um, that is driving a lot of this. But of course, as you saw from the experimental study, doing like comfortable, chill, positive things with a partner like is also super cool. It just doesn't seem to have the same ability to like boost desire on average. It seems like it kind of fosters more of those closeness and security elements, which like we also want in relationships. So there's nothing wrong with kind of more mundane positive experiences. But it just seems like some of the novelty and excitement have this additional potential for boosting our connection with our partner. This is a related question. Uh, are there any physiological effects that go along with the novelty that can account for the promoting of satisfaction? 
Yeah, I haven't looked at that in my own work, but like in one of the classic studies. So Art Aaron is a prominent relationship researcher and he developed self-expansion theory and he did some of the early studies on this. And one of his famous studies is this Capilano Bridge study. And essentially he had people go over like a scary bridge that would lead to like high physiological arousal and then like a safe sturdy bridge where people wouldn't have like the, it would be low arousal. And they were basically approached by a research assistant in each of those scenarios and on like the scary high arousing bridge they were more likely to feel attracted to the person and like want to contact them after and have more like romantic and sexual interest in the person. So there's definitely been a role of this like physiological arousal in this research. Um, and I think it would be fascinating to be able to look at that in the lab. One of the things that we've, one of the directions that we're taking this work in is trying to see if we can elicit self-expanding experiences like in VR, so having couples meet up and do an activity in VR and seeing if they can gain some of the same benefits from doing that. And that would allow couples to have self-expanding experiences, you know, when they're not in the same geographical location. And I think it would be fascinating if we can find a way to manipulate the self-expansion in that context is to also include these physiological, like measures of how, of people's physiological response and see how much that's actually impacting it. The only way we could do that here was just coding the activities. And this wasn't based on actually how arousing they found it. It was just based on objective indicators, right? Like bungee jumping is objectively a more arousing activity than like watching a documentary, but both as it turns out can be self-expanding. And at least in our study could then have these associations with desire and satisfaction. Great, there are a, a few questions um, more about these ex self-expansion activities. Uh, okay. We've talked mostly about activities today. What about, and, and you did mention cultural immersion or involvement with uh, yeah. a cross-cultural relationships. Are there um, cognitive processes or um, like broadening of perspective that might be beneficial and act similarly? Yeah, that's exactly right. So even some of the items, they do tap into experiences and activities, but also broadening of perspectives. Um, that seems to be an important part of it as well. And I think in large part is what's driving our effects for the intercultural couples. Although definitely there was some people did talk about engaging in like these cultural related activities with a partner and that that could be self-expanding a lot more of those examples were really about seeing things in a different way. And it really did, at least people described this, it having an effect on like their own self perceptions, right? Sometimes you, you know, my, the student who I work on that project with, she's really a cultural psychologist. And the one thing that she talks about is, you know, culture to us is kind of like water to fish. We're in it all the time, but we don't always realize it. And so I think sometimes through having these experiences, whether it's with a romantic partner or other people that you're meeting with different cultural backgrounds or perspectives, it's giving you a new perspective and also kind of making you reflect on your own experiences and, you know, what might be pretty culturally situated that you might not have thought deeply about before. So I definitely think the broadening of perspectives is a big part of it and actually probably a reason why the arousal doesn't matter a lot because I think some of those broadening of perspectives, I mean, I think a lot of us have had those experiences, you know, they can be pretty impactful and it's not that, you know, it's not physically intense, but it's, you know, it shifts our perspective and those things can, I think, be pretty powerful when they happen. So I definitely think that's an important part of it. Awesome. Uh, there are a couple of questions about different kinds of couples. So one question came up and you can an answer them separately or together about what you know. Uh, couples who are low income versus high income couples or people in open relationships or polygamous relationships versus monogamous relationships. Are there patterns or similarities or differences with those couples, those types of couples? Yeah, that's such a great question. So as far as we can tell, the question about the income is an important one, right? Because, you know, I think going into this, one of the things I thought was, you know, what are couples going to report in their daily lives? And is this going to be like, I've got to go on the European vacation or, you know, I've got to do this extreme adventure sport or something like that. 
And, you know, I was really surprised to learn that a lot of these day-to-day self-expanding activities that were having this impact were things that were very easy to do in daily life. Um, so a lot of them did not involve having to have a lot of money or a lot of resources. I think couples could do this. And in our samples, we don't really see differences like based on income, education, but I will acknowledge that we don't have good representation in a lot of our samples in relationship research of like lower income couples. And there is a trend toward moving to this because we do know that some of the associations that, you know, relationship researchers find fairly robustly are different when we then look at couples who are lower income or lower socioeconomic status. So I think that is an important question. From what I can tell from this work, the self-expand, maybe there's some activities that might look different if we look at couples, you know, across like age and income, what they do to self-expand, there might be some differences in that. But I think the associations with the outcomes are fairly consistent from what we can tell. Um, I do also do work on consensually non-monogamous relationships. We haven't actually looked at self-expansion in the context of those relationships, but I think it would be fascinating. And I think one really interesting question would be to see if people are deriving these additional self-expanding opportunities, you know, from their various partners. And also, you know, one of the things I've been really interested in and thinking about consensually non-monogamous relationships is whether something that's happening in, a, in another concurrent relationship can then have benefits for the primary relationship or one of the other relationships. And we've seen this in other domains, like around sexual fulfillment, you know, having sexual fulfillment in one, one relationship can have benefits for another concurrent relationship, which I think is really interesting. And I think, you know, this area of research is really moving towards like understanding these processes in terms of like what maintains satisfaction in this context of consensual non-monogamy. And I can only imagine that self-expansion plays a role in some of that. And that maybe, you know, there's like a little bit of work on something that is referred to as like new relationship energy. So when people get into a new relationship in the context of consensual non-monogamy, they sort of experience some of those heightened desire and, you know, passion feelings that we know are characteristic of most new relationships. And then the idea is that that can also translate into the other existing relationships and kind of charge those relationships as well. I haven't seen a good empirical test of that idea, but I think self-expansion would potentially have a role in that. It would be super fascinating to explore. Um, there's a question just in general about social media and the impact of communicating in social media or through various different media. Um, does that have an impact? I think they're interested in just like secure relationships or maybe enhancing relationship satisfaction or actually detrimental. Yeah, that's a good question. I have another line of research on social media and relationships that, you know, is, is a little bit older. And, you know, I feel like social media has changed so much since I was doing this work. But we certainly did when Facebook initially became popular, for example, we did see that when people spent more time on it, they were more likely to be exposed to like unknown things about their partner that could trigger jealousy. Um, and this sometimes kind of had a pattern where then you would like look for more information. Um, you know, so I think there is that when you have this online presence and, you know, you have this wider exposure that can sometimes create like new unique threats for relationships. Um, but you know, these social media sites are also a place where people, you know, share things about their relationship, right? They, you know, can put up a relationship status or like pictures with a partner and those kinds of things. And we have shown that that can be linked at least back in the day before Facebook is what it is now could, um, you know, have was linked up with like relationship satisfaction and commitment. So I think it's kind of a new way that we're exploring these things, but you know, these, so it's, it's constantly changing. Um, but I think it's an interesting direction to think about because we are experiencing more and more of our social relationships online. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I've really enjoyed, hopefully everybody enjoyed the, the Q and A and got their questions answered. Um, uh, we are that we are now about to take a break for about 15 minutes or so and um, remember everybody that you need to click on the next link for David Buss's talk um, to, to, to participate 
and we'll be there in about 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.